Hi everyone, welcome to today's lesson. In this video, we're gonna talk about the American Revolution. We're not necessarily gonna break down all the different battles and fighting and who was there and what did they do. We're gonna talk more about some of the enlightenment ideas that influenced the American Revolution and then what took place after the American Revolution to set up the republic that we know and love today. So make sure you're in your interactive notebook and you're following along. All right, we're on page four of your interactive notebook. And again, today we're talking about the American Revolution. Let's start off with our essential question. How did Enlightenment ideas help spur the American colonies to shed British rule and create a new nation? Now, some of this might be a review for you because, hey, we live in the United States. You might have learned about this before way back, maybe in the seventh or eighth grade, but it's been quite some time. So let's have a little bit of a recap. We're gonna go through and talk about some of the things that caused the revolution, a few quick details about the revolution, and then what happens afterwards. So again, let's remind ourselves what was happening in the American colonies in the 16 and 1700s that caused these tensions and caused the American colonies to grow themselves. So we have the British took over the Americas um, and the colonies that they established grew very large and very populous. Lots of British citizens wanted to go and help colonize and then generation after generation starts to live there. And so the colonies are thriving economically because they're trading extensively with places throughout Europe. Now, they're bringing in lots of money um, and the colonies are very happy. Britain is getting a chunk of it, but Britain starts to realize that they don't want them trading so much with the rest of Europe as much as they want them trading with themselves. So they start to pass some taxes and some regulations uh, that limit the colony's trading patterns. Patterns. The first one comes in 1651, which becomes known as the, Brit the British Navigation Act. And that restricts trade with the colonies as well as with a few other different regulations and taxes. But it basically makes it uh, impossible for the uh, colonies to trade with anyone other than Britain. And this starts raising some red flags in the colonies because colonists by this time are starting to identify less and less as British subjects and more and more as American colonists. So there's starting to be this kind of um, separation, we'll say, um, between no, separation of identities, I guess we'll say, because they're not, again, like I said, identifying as we don't live in Britain, we're not British subjects, we're American colonists, we are 3000 miles away. Um, so that's going to start to lead into some tensions. Uh, tensions are also going to arise after the French and Indian War. The colonists helped the British in 1763 win the French and Indian War. So it was a war against the French and the Native American population. Um, they had teamed up together against Britain and its colonies. So the colonies helped win in 1763 and wars aren't free. They're and they're not cheap. Um, so in order to pay for the war debts of the French and Indian War, they decide to tax the colonists. Britain decides to tax its colonists. That was the one great thing about the colonies. Britain saw it as a tax generator. Um, it was a way for them to generate re revenue for the British kingdom. Uh, the colonists aren't very happy about that. Uh, they argued that the Britain couldn't tax them without our or the colonists representation in Cong or Parliament. Uh, this is where the very famous quote of no taxation without representation from Patrick Henry comes down. And no, that's not Mr. Henry from uh, Auto Body. Um, but Patrick Henry is very famous for saying that that quote because there was zero colonial representation in British Parliament, meaning they could make all these laws and regulations, but the colonies had no say in them. And with ideas from the Enlightenment, where we start to see individual rule and individual freedoms, the colonists are starting to say like, we don't like this whole a guy 3,000 miles away telling us what to do. We don't like that. So we're, like I said, we're starting to see those tensions arise. By 1773, after a series of regulations and taxes had been passed, the colonists start to protest. One of the biggest protests becomes known as the British Tea Party, where they posed as Native Americans and threw a bunch of tea in the Boston Harbor. Uh, we have by 1774, colonists meet in Philadelphia to address these British policies and kind of decide what do they want to do. And our first shots are fired in 1775 um, in Lexington and Concord. And so we're starting to see the American Revolution kick off. 
Now, influences from the Enlightenment. Colonial leaders are pushing for independence. They don't want to be a colony of Great Britain anymore. And they're really relying heavily on some of those Enlightenment ideas that we talked about in the previous video. Uh, we have the Declaration of Independence, which is penned by Thomas Jefferson. Um, and it's a document that justifies why the American colonies wanted to rebel, why they feel that they are just in doing that, why they have the ability to do that. Um, and Thomas Jefferson took a lot of ideas from John Locke, which we talked about with the Enlightenment as well. We do see success for the colonists, spoiler alert. Um, despite their strength, you know, the British army was a tough competitor. Um, the colonial armies were all sometimes no match because we were like little militias compared to a very well-regulated army. Uh, but the colonists did have three major advantages. First off, they were very motivated. They wanted their freedom. Um, so that you know, motivation in a war can, you know, drives forces in droves. Second, the French come in and do help assist the American colonists, kind of as like a payback for the French and Indian War. So they come in and lend us supplies, they lend us um, troops, things like that. And then lastly, as we said before, wars aren't cheap. Um, and so Great Britain, you know, they went through and they fought this war for a few years. They're sending troops and supplies overseas, 3,000 miles away becomes a hefty price. And so British citizens back in mainland Great Britain start to realize they don't wanna pay for this anymore. Um, they were being taxed uh, to pay for the war and pay and finance for the war. And so they start kind of crying for it, we're done. Give them the colonies, we don't care, call for peace. Um, and so eventually that does lead to a surrender in Yorktown in 1781 by the British um, and officially the colonists won the war. From here now, the American colonies had to figure out, all right, we're a brand new nation. We are no longer um, a colonial power. We are our own entity and we have to set up a government. So they be, do become a, a republic and they publish what are known as the Articles of Confederation. This is what formally sets up our first government and a plan for the republic. The articles were pretty weak though. They only set up a legislative branch. There was no executive branch. There's no judicial branch. Um, it sets up, as I said, a weak national government, and it really failed to provide unity and order. The Articles of Confederation were kind of a good idea on paper because it set up a confederal government where each state has more power than a national government, but it became very convoluted, very conflicting. Laws in one state conflicted with other states, and there was this no, there wasn't a unifying power at the head. We were just kind of like different states with our heads cut off, and there was no way to kind of collect us all together. So it was very jumbled and mishmashed and very, very weak. Um, and the writers of the Articles of Confederation and our founding fathers quickly realized that if we didn't get our stuff together, this whole America thing wasn't going to last very long. So in 1787, they call a constitutional convention and they come together to revise these articles and draft a new constitution. They insisted that we needed a constitution and we needed a federal government where there is a strong national government um, and then some power in the smaller state governments. The constitution contained a lot of different ideas from the Enlightenment. Um, and that's what really helped us draft and, you know, put in a living document that is still here today, um, you know, so many years later. Uh, the Constitution, as we know, created a brand, three branches of government. It provides for checks and balances. Each branch is going to share power equally. Um, we're going to have a federal government. It's going to have, again, we're have a, we have a divide between the nation or the, nas the national government and the state government. So states don't just have to follow pretty, they don't have to follow everything. They can have some choices. They have some states' rights. They just can't go against federal or national law. Um, so that, that was one thing that they compromised on. Uh, yes, we have a strong national government, but each individual state can also run itself as sort of like a mini government, as long as it doesn't go against the national government. There were some of the founding fathers that feared that giving too much power to the executive branch could cause problems. Um, a lot of them felt like the Constitution, as it was originally written, didn't give any individual rights. Again, an enlightenment idea of individual freedoms and rights. There were a lot of founding fathers that said, we aren't signing off on this thing unless we get some sort of guarantee for citizens. 
Um, so the way in which the compromise that came down, uh, the way in which these founding fathers signed off on the Constitution was after the addition of the Bill of Rights. And as a reminder, the Bill of Rights are the first 10 amendments to the Constitution again, that guarantee and protect individual freedoms. Uh, the Constitution goes on to be amended 17 more times with a total of 27 amendments, but these are the first 10. Um, and again, it's a way in which that the Constitution is a living document and can constantly be amended and updated and changed. Um, so these Enlightenment ideas really did help to solidify the government that was put in place after the revolution. Um, and it's something that has continued us on to current day. Um, so thank you, Enlightenment. Um, all right, in our next lesson, we're going to talk about the French Revolution. So make sure all of this is in your interactive notebook, and we'll see you in that video. Thanks for watching.